So take this heart, Lord. I'll be your vessel. Welcome to the teaching ministry of Reverend JFK Mensah, a seasoned Bible teacher with over 40 years of ministry experience. He is a pastor, a church planter, a missionary, and an international conference speaker. He is passionate about making Christ-like disciples worldwide. JFK Mensah is the General Overseer of Great Commission Church International. May you be transformed as you listen to the Word of God. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you Heavenly Father, we thank you for this army you are building. Uh, this evening, we ask that your spirit will fall once again. Your power, enough to carry them for a whole year. Lord, help us to be mindful of the potholes and manholes that are on the way so that we can get home safely. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please take your seat. Thank you. Uh, today, before we have the impartation, I want to share with you what I consider 10 of the most dangerous pitfalls in Christian leadership. I entered into full-time ministry in 1978 and I was ordained 1979. So 2019 is my 40th year as an ordained minister. So I believe that the points I'm sharing are not just theory. They are they are challenges. You know, for 12 years I was the Volta Regional Pastor for my former church and I ha our headquarters was in Tema so I drove to Tema to give my accounts and reports every month for 12 years so I knew every pothole on the road from Hohwe to Tema I could close my eyes and tell you that there is a portal here. There's a portal here. You have to mind this one. So over the years, I've seen mighty men of God fall. And I've seen people, nobody gave a dog's chance in ministry, rise up. So allow me, I don't have the luxury and the time to comment much on these 10 potholes and pitfalls. One day when we have more time, I can break them down for you. But for today, I just want to list them for you. You can understand that Satan doesn't fear anointing. Because Isaiah chapter 14, from verse 12 to 16, and Ezekiel chapter 28, 12 to 17, we are told that Satan was the anointed cherub. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? We didst weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall not look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this a man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Now, because he himself was an anointed cherub, he does not fear anointing. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, tell us that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, the devil drew near to him to tempt him. Luke 4, 1 and 2. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Now, please pause a little. This is Jesus. He has just been baptized and heaven opened. The Spirit of God came upon him in the form of a dove. He was full of the Spirit and led by the Spirit, but tempted by the devil for 40 days. No anointing on your life ever frightens Satan. In fact, the Luke 4.13 says, Satan left Jesus for an opportune time. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. He departed from Jesus for a season. Not that I'm finished with you. <laughs> so you need a everlasting watchfulness if you want to stay on the road. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27 that lest after preaching to others, I myself should be a castaway. So ministry itself doesn't frighten Satan. Anointing doesn't frighten him. So you need to take care of where the potholes are. I have labored to try and arrange them in order of importance, but I have failed. So the list I'm giving you is a raw list. It's, you know, you put it in any order you want. But number one is putting ministry above your intimacy with God. The number one danger in Christian leadership is when the ministry, your service of God becomes so important for you that you, you, you leave the time you spend with God in order to minister. You have failed. In Luke chapter 10 from verse 38 to 42, we are told about the story of Mary and Martha. Jesus was a guest in their home. And Martha was busy about cooking, about washing, about you know, cleaning up the house, about serving Jesus. But Mary, her sister, sat at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus. And after some time, Mary was distraught. She, she came, Master, don't you care? My sister has left me alone to do all the serving. She's sitting comfortably at your feet. Tell her to help me now. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are preoccupied with a lot of service. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that better part. It will not be taken away from her. Yeah, you can read it. 38 to 42. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. 
But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part. We shall not be taken away from her. Jesus himself, in Luke chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, we are told that great multitudes came to Jesus to hear him and to be healed. But he himself often withdrew into the wilderness to pray. Luke 5, 15, 16. But so much the more went there, a fame abroad of him. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. You see, people want to hear you. People want to be healed. But Jesus withdrew often into the wilderness to pray. Because prayer and being with God is more important than ministry. It's more important than miracles. When you lose God, you lose your ministry. Wow. So there are times I don't pick my mobile phone because I am with the general manager of the universe. Whatever pressing news any church member has it's okay i'm with the manager i want to please him first number two popularity versus christ-like character leadership is enhanced by followership the more people who follow you, the greater your leadership. So, Proverbs 14, 28 says that in the multitude of a people is a king's honor. But when people are few, then you see that leadership is destroyed. Proverbs 14, 28, in the multitude of people is the king's honor, but in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. But... The same Bible says in Exodus 23 verse 2, you shall not follow a multitude to do evil. Exodus 23 2, thou shall not follow a multitude to do evil. Don't allow popularity with people because you want to be popular, you want them to accept you, you want people to follow you. Don't allow it to compromise your Christ-like character. You, you need to put your foot down. Because 1 Samuel chapter 15 from verse 21 to 23 Samuel, prophet Samuel told King Saul when he complained that you know the people said we should bring the best animals and sacrifice. The people, the people. Then <laughs> Samuel told him uh, is the Lord more interested in sacrifices than obedience? You see, you need to understand in your walk with God that your character matters more than any number of people in your church. Because in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 to 23, Jesus said, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Because on that day, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have you not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name I have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Character. Christ-like character is of more value in the kingdom of God than the number of people following you. You need to get that into your spirit. When people are pressurizing you, you see, 
the majority can vote for something which is wrong it does not make it right if the whole world votes that homosexuality is right it doesn't make it right before god god's government is not dependent on your votes he was god before you were born he will be god after you are dead his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom his dominion shall never pass away no human uh, consensus that we in ghana think that there is nothing wrong with this thing therefore god you are forced to accept it there, you can't pressurize god isaiah chapter 40 verse 15 and 17 says he regards all the nations of the earth as nothing they are like a drop in a bucket like dust on a scale before him behold the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as a small dust of the balance god Be counts all the nations as a small dust on the balance behold he taketh up the isles as a very little thing and, and 17 17 says all nations before him are as nothing all nations before him are as nothing and they are counted to him less than nothing and See, vanity he counts china less than nothing he counts united states of america less than nothing he counts the nations as less than nothing when when i was growing up we used to insult people that you are nothing before the decimal point <laughs> so all the nations the united nations are nothing before god he counts them as a drop in a bucket less than nothing therefore the vote of all human beings that this is right because we feel is right does not change god he cannot be changed so though we live in a fast changing world we serve an unchanging god and and people with itching ears can easily pressurize your ministry until you are doing what they want until your evening services are tailored to satisfy them until the sermons you preach only appeal to them not god you, you need to watch it number three is sexual scandal your whole ministry can be destroyed by wrong sex approaches are you with me yeah. you know the big difference between joseph and samson is that Potiphar's wife pressurized Joseph, sleep with me, sleep with me, sleep with me, until she held his, his dress, but he ran out and refused to compromise. Samson, Delilah pressurized him, tell me your secret, tell me your secret, tell me your secret, and he broke under it. On the ties of a a, a gentile prostitute the man of god whom even jesus they sent an angel once to talk the, about his birth but samson the angel was sent twice he was anointed from the womb and by his youth he was already carrying power that's what judges chapter uh, uh, 13 verse 25 says even as a young man, he was flowing in the anointing. Hey, clap for the technical team. They are really doing a good job. And the spirit of the Lord began to move him at, at times in the camp of Dan between Zora and Esther. As a young man, he, you see, he took a lion and 
call it and the anointing he killed 1000 people with the jawbone of an ass that's anointing if that's not anointing i don't know the meaning but on the thighs of a woman they shaved him sakura and he was grinding corn for his enemies to make a plan. They removed his eyes. And Judges chapter 16 verse 20 says that the spirit of the Lord left him and he did not know. <laughs> and she said, the Philistines are upon thee, Samson. Yes. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I'll go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. The man of God did not know that the Lord was departed from him. One day, one day, one day, one day, that you're chasing girls, it will be too much. One day. You see? It wasn't the first day David started chasing women that God punished him. You see, he was already married to Micah, but then he took Ahinoam. Then he took Nabal's widow. Then when he was made king in Hebron, he multiplied more wives. Then he was made king in Jerusalem. He took more wives. And not only that, somebody's wife having her bath. So because of King David, women should not bath. It pains me to give some of these examples. But a person like Jimmy Swaggart, when his ministry was at the top, we were then growing up. There were whole islands. The chief of the island and all the villagers would take, sit before the television when Jimmy Swaggart is preaching, be weeping and just. So when he fell, the damage cannot be calculated with any computer. You see? Jim Baker. His fall. It made it sad that many Americans for their generation didn't trust any televangelist. He saw any man who was an evangelist on television, they believed that he was messian. So, you just have to watch it. You see that whenever I go anywhere, my wife is with me. Yeah, yeah. yeah I carry her like a snail carries the the the, the, <laughs> the shell. <laughs> I remember when we went to Nigeria. Somebody said, "You go everywhere with your wife, your ministry." What did she say? You will go far. You will go far. You will go far. You will go far. When you see me, you see my wife because she is my protection. Some women. You know, by the grace of God, Second Peter two fourteen says they have eyes filled with adultery. You know, some of them when they just look at you, their eyes tell you, "Come and sleep with me." Of course, it's not only women. There are some men too like that. But I am, I, I, I am preaching, so allow me. So when she is around me, she is my shield and buckler. And such women have no access to me again because my wife is around. She has interpreted uh, Genesis chapter 19 that when Lot's wife became a pillar of salt, Lot slept with his two daughters and impregnated them. If the wife were to be around, at least she would have saved that problem. So, please, don't let it happen before you repent. You, you, you can troubleshoot and know that, no, 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 no. Where I'm going now is not correct. And please, with all uh, what 
humility. And my sisters, the lady pastors, you, you, you need to keep closely under the authority of your husband to save yourself and your ministry. We've seen too much. We had a lady who had a powerful healing gift and she, you know people and a man arrived that same day and said the Lord spoke to me that I should come and marry you. He succeeded in sleeping with that prophetess that day. You say oh some of the things I just say Lord have mercy on us. So please build enough hedges around yourself so that there is no sexual scandal. Because even if the thing you haven't done it if I see you coming out of my bedroom and you are in Jakoto and my wife is in Pyoto and you say, I haven't done anything. I haven't done anything. It's difficult to trust you. You see, just because of the... You see, you, to see you doing... Amen. Amen. Number four is financial scandal. Financial scandal. First Timothy chapter 6 verses 6 and 7 say that we brought nothing into this world and it is true we can take nothing out therefore godliness with contentment is great gain First Timothy chapter 6 verses 6 and 7, seven. but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world. If anybody came into this world with dollar or a car, please get up. <laughs> if you arrived here with a piece of land, get up, let's see you. We were born naked. And nobody is burying you with your four-wheel drive or piece of land. You have all the papers and titled it, but they won't bury you with it because it's not yours. If you take anything out of this world, you are a thief. You brought nothing. If I came here and I didn't have any uh, uh, camera and I'm living here and I'm taking camera out, am I not a thief? You came naked into this world. You will leave this world naked. Therefore, think, be wise. You, you need to wise up. You cannot carry property from this world. Don't allow financial material things to steal your heart you see you need to discipline your heart so that you will live a simple lifestyle and it is certain we can carry nothing out are you with me yeah. jesus put it bluntly in luke chapter 14 verse 33 he said that Anybody who cannot forsake everything he has cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. This is the trap that the rich round ruler fell into. He couldn't make it. You know, because you are a, a pastor, you are a spiritual leader, some of the girls, when you say, come, they won't mind you. If they say, pastor says, come, they will come. In the same way, because you are a, a man of God or woman of God, there are opportunities to make money which are not open to ordinary human beings. You see? Because people open up to you they open up their heart, their treasures to you. Because, can you imagine? Jesus cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene. So she wanted to give herself everything she had to Jesus. 
So Luke 8, 1 to 3. He said he followed, she followed Jesus. She was the last at the cross, the first at the tomb resurrection. Because you have cast seven demons out of me. I, I, I want to serve you. I want to I, I want to give you myself. I want everything. So she used her money to feed Jesus. See, every you know, human beings are like that. And therefore, when you are a man of God and God uses you to heal a sick person, to cast out demons, to you know, people are so grateful that they can be abused. You need you need to restrain yourself. Are you with me? If you don't rule your spirit. Gehazi, Judas Iscariot, Ananias and Sapphira, Achan, all those things will just take hold of you. And before you know what, you are never satisfied. I don't know. It's more than 20 years now my wife is here. I've never bought a dress or a shoe. Do you understand? Last time I went and warned some of the people not to give me any shirts or buy anything for me for one year. You know, because I have enough. But recently they sent some three suits again. I have one body. Eh? If, you, if, if, I, if I wear two suits now at the same time, people will say I'm mad. <laughs> My wife's uncle was a very important official in the United Nations. He had almost 200 suits hanging. Brand new ones. Brand new ones. When he had a stroke. You brought nothing into this world. You will take nothing out. Don't let this world and the goods of this world control your life and ministry. Otherwise, what will happen is that the people who stock your fridge, the people who fill your purse, the people who give you money, when they are left to is paining them. You rush to the house. Jesus! The blood of Jesus! And pray 30 minutes. Another person in the church who is poor, semi-literate, has nothing to offer as far as you are concerned. But it's also bought by the same blood of Jesus. When that person is sick, has problems, hey, I'm coming. Uh, you wait. Let me see if Friday I can come. Hey, because you, your heart knows that he doesn't stock your fridge. And what happens is they gag you. The rich people in the church can become your Holy Spirit. Anyway, let's go on. So number seven. Where, where are we? Number one is when you allow ministry to take over your yeah. intimacy with God. Number two, popularity when popularity character. takes over Christ-like character. Number three, yeah. sexual scandals. Number four, financial scandals. Okay. Number five is pride. Pride. You know, to be a leader, there is something excellent about you. That is why you are a leader. This is it. So, already the grounds have been set for you to be proud. Because you know that you sing better than everybody in this church. You know you preach better than everybody in this church. You know that you are more beautiful than everybody in this church. So because of that, your heart becomes too full. <laughs> so for the minister, after the, the worst of all is pride of grace. You have a grace like healing, like prophetic anointing. It's a grace. Everybody knows that it's a grace. But because of that, you are proud. It's a grace, but the grace God has given you has made you proud. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says that. What do you have which is not a gift? And if it's a gift, why are you boasting about it? 
First Corinthians 4, 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? You must understand that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. That's James chapter 4 verse 6. Some things which happen to us, it is not Satan. It's God himself who is resisting you in life because of the way you are carrying yourself. James 4, 6 and 7. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he said, God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Did you hear that? God resists the proud. First Peter 5, 5 also says the same things. Verse 5 and 6. First Peter 5, 5 and 6. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye, all of you, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisted the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So, humble yourselves. You can, you can have a ministry that God is resisting. You, you need to understand. Jesus said in Luke 14, verse 11, that Anyone who exalts himself shall be abased. Anyone who abases himself shall be exalted. He himself, okay. Luke 14, 11, for whosoever exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Then, number six now, is the extremes of what we call elation and discouragement. Uh, in ministry, when God gives you a tough ministry, you can work, 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 fast, 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 pray, 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 go to conference after conference, steady, 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 steady. But you look at your ministry, it's not, nothing is happening. You see? I, I'm not sure, but let's check it. Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. I think 13 and 14. He says that, I know where you are. That place, the town you are in, is where Satan has his throne. His that town. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest. Yes. Even where Satan's seat is. Yes, the town you are in, Satan himself, his para paramountcy is there. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you when Satan dwelleth. So, you see, in ministry, there are some places. When I went to Mauritania, I saw it. <laughs> Look, in Ghana, you can plant a church in one week. We went there four years. We were praying one hour every morning. One hour every evening, every Sunday, we gathered pastors to pray in my house from four to six. We fasted every Tuesday for four years and we baptized four Mauritanians. Wow. Yeah. Then I saw that the field was heavy. <laughs> Compare that, you know, we went to Tamale. I've never been to Tamale. We wanted to plant a church in Tamale. Two, three of us. We just boarded transport here. Got to Tamale about 4 a.m. Prayed for one hour at the park. And then in the morning, we entered the, the city and started speaking to people. By the end of the day, we had found, you know, one of the, the high court judges there. I baptized him and prayed for him for Holy Spirit. And so he said, oh, my house is here. Anything you want to do. And by the end of the day we win. and the church has been there now for over 30 years in Tamale so in Ghana it's easy to plant a church but there are some places you know that you are laboring and you see it is easy to become so discouraged that Moses told God in Numbers 11 kill me let me die is this, are these my children you are, they, they are troubling me I want to die and in 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, Elijah, he went 40 days and said, I want to die. After he brought down fire from heaven. Ministry can be such that 
you move between very high spirits of breakthrough to very low depths of discouragement because the things going on you can't understand you know you've done evangelism you've gone house to house you've prayed you've had all night you are expecting 40 people in church and 15 show up you are like what, what can i do again oh so it can put a certain pressure on you and you as a minister you can have depression I remember when I went to Australia, they told me that half of all the pastors in Australia resigned. Because the way, you see, ministry was going, they couldn't match it. That's it. Anyway, number seven. Neglect of family. Neglect of family. It is clear in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, that the way to measure your Christian leadership is by looking at your wife and children. Let's read it. The litmus test for your ministry is your family life. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? If a man know not how to take care of his own house, how, 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 how shall he take care of the house of God? So many of us, because of fasting, praying, and you know, you have some some sisters in the church who really like all night and uh, you know then who is your wife your children oh don't mind them look the lord says we should love the lord for all our heart your ch- wife and children are the litmus test for your ministry any man of god listen to the wife When you are preaching and your wife says, and people are saying, I receive it. I receive it. Amen. And your wife is like, your ministry is finished. Your ministry is finished. Did you hear me? If you you don't believe me, go and read about Eli in 1 Samuel. Go and read about Samuel. Go and read about David. The children of those homes made God swear to Eli that no old person will ever be in your house as long as I live. If there is any case bigger than that, I want to know. Samuel, he had so much integrity that he stood before the whole Israel. He said, from my youth till this time, I have judged you. If I have accepted bribe from anybody, Stand up. And the whole Israel was quiet because of integrity, clean hands. But his children were worse than goats. And Israel was forced to ask for a king because Samuel's children were accepting bribes. Look at David. Eh? A man after God's heart. But look at his house. Eh? Look at Amnon raping the sister Tamar. Look at Absalom killing your brother. That, that type of uh, 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 sleeping with your father's wives, ten of them on the rooftop. You a son of a man after God's heart. How can you do that? You see, our children govern the next generation therefore any passion you have put it into the children you don't need to be a politician you don't need ever to walk into parliament but you can control ghana by your children look at the kennedys they are from the same house look at george bush and his son two presidents from one house yeah 
Because your children matter. Number eight, neglect of health. Neglect of health. Neglect of health. Many of us, because of passion for God, we eat anything, anytime. We refuse to drink water. We don't take vegetables and fruits. We don't have time for exercise. We break all the rules. We take more sugar than we should. We don't even taste food before putting salt inside. We, then we say Job chapter 6 verse 6. How can anything tasteless be eaten without salt? And then, you know. <laughs> what happens is that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. When your body is faint, the anointing cannot work. President Obama went to Billy Graham and asked him to mentor him. And Billy said he couldn't because he is old. Yeah. So, on this planet F, you need to work on your body and take that care of it which will cause the spirit to use it far. Personally, I've noticed that when I'm too tired, the revelations I receive are not reliable. <laughs> yeah. They are not reliable. Because I am too tired. You see? And you can have burn up. Burn out. And you can anything. There was a time they said for three months I shouldn't preach because I was overworking myself. And I was not resting in between. I wasn't obeying the rules of health. And you know, ministers like that, you die. Bo, bo, bo. At least in the newspapers, three pastors in this Ghana died after finishing a 40 day fast the newspapers alone those not reported are not there you see because it, fasting is not as difficult as breaking the fast you need to obey the rules of breaking a fast if you don't obey them they will show you something so you need to make rules concerning how you use your body if you neglect your health, it will fail you the time you need it most. And that's the end. So many in the 50s, many of our miracle workers, they died at age 50, 55, 54. Billy died at 99, almost 100 years old. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says that the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in our bodies to quicken, make alive our mortal bodies. Therefore, every Christian has more resources for living longer than the average unbeliever. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. But, number nine, in the potholes and the dangers, pitfalls of Christian leadership is plateauing. Plateauing. You know, you can, as a minister, get to a place where you think, what kind of thing man no, no, no see before? So you stop growing spiritually. You stop working on yourself. And because of that, you plateau. You see that, you know, you are still preaching. You are still healing the sick, laying hands on people, Holy Spirit baptism, but 
you you are stunted you have come to a place where you 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 are not growing again that's it the hunger and thirst for god which was in you before you came into ministry has left let's read revelations chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 Revelations 2, 4, and 5. Nevertheless, I have some words against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlesticks out of his place, except thou repent. So this state, fortunately, nobody can know except yourself. It's like a man and a wife at home. When you notice that your wife doesn't love you as she used to do, only you can tell. Because she will cook, fetch water, iron your clothes, wash the things, take care of the children. Everything is going on well. But you yourself know between the two of you that some fire in the love is gone. So, after some time of being in ministry, some ministers are like that. They, they've lost it. You see, that thing, first love, which makes them, you know, be on fire for Jesus and want to just draw near to Jesus for himself is gone. All the rest is ministry. You, you are just doing the things mechanically, but you, 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 something is not there. Now, if you get there, only you can know. Because deep inside you, you look back at the time you were born again, the joy of salvation, the types of things you were doing, and so on. It's not, even if you are old, passion can be recognized. I, I am old now. I'm over 63. I was 65. I, oh, yes, 65 this year. You know, but it does not change my passion. You see, the zeal, the passion I had for God when I became born again is still there. God has given me grace. I've never backslided in my life. You see, but only you can tell if the fire is gone. Then you are plateauing. And when you are plateauing, you yourself know that from day to day you are just jogging so anointing service no anointing service it doesn't really do anything to you because the state of your heart at this time is beyond cure you, you need to wake up in yourself and put more fire into what you are doing even if you have truth but it's cold truth it kills it must be truth on fire. It is that which people who meet you can feel. They feel the, the white heat of truth on fire. And then the last, number 10, which I want to put up for today in our work with God as what I find very challenging is Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, vengeance, vendetta, hatred. Yes. Why? Because there are some church members and leaders who set themselves to resist you, to oppose you, to badmouth you, to malign you, to slander you to murmur, grumble about you, to complain. Everything you do, they have something negative to say about it. And a time comes, if you don't watch your spirit, you will find out that they are annoying you to some extent that you, you, your anger shows on your face. And then, when you keep it in, you become bitter. And unforgiveness creeps in. And before you know what, you want to curse. And, and in addition to that, vengeance and so on. 
in first peter chapter 2 verse 21 to 23 the bible says that this is the reason you have been called christ suffered for us leaving us an example that we should walk in his steps who did no sin neither was guile lying found in his mouth when he suffered he did not threaten anybody when he was insulted he didn't insult back but he committed his case to the righteous judge yes first peter chapter 2 21 to 23 for even here unto were he called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that he should follow his steps who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth who when he was reviled reviled not again when he suffered he threatened not but committed himself to him that judges righteously have you ever read john chapter 6 verse 70 john chapter 6, six 70 six, seven zero. verse 70 Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is the devil? Jesus knew that Judas Iscariot was going to betray him, but he kept him in the twelve until he did his work. Amen. Amen. That's enough. So, we are going to have the anointing. These ten things, they cause the anointing to leak like a hole under the bucket. So, you fill the bucket, but you don't know where the water has run to. So, you go for anointing service after anointing service and ask yourself, why am I still like this? Powerful men of God have laid their hands on me, but look, it is because of the whole. <laughs> yes, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, having such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which besets us and run with patience the race that has been set for us, looking unto Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Now he's sitting at the right hand of God. You have not yet resisted sin to the shedding of your blood. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Oh, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin we do so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, um, the way we are doing this anointing service is that I'm not going to spend a long time on anybody. I'm just going to touch you, anoint you, that's all. Yeah. Now, you need to understand that God is searching for men and women who will dare to believe him for impossible things so that he can use them to do those things. You see, if God wants to bring water out of a rock, he needs to get somebody who believes that water can come out of a rock. Then he can use that person. Wow. Are you with me? Yes. Because there are certain things God wants to do on this earth and he finds a man who can believe that Goliath can be killed and that person can use a stone to kill Goliath because God wants Goliath down. But he needs a man who can believe him so when you are you have an anointing service you must understand that there is a certain supernatural almighty omnipotent sovereign king of kings who has agenda on this earth he wants to do the things 
He knows you cannot do them, but he wants to do them. He needs you so that God can part the Red Sea. God can part the Red Sea without Moses. Why, why does he say, go raise your staff? Because he needed a man to stand and represent him. And when Moses raised the staff, the sea parted. The anointing service is for such people. When you are anointed, you are put into a realm where you can cooperate with God to bring to pass impossible things in your ministry, which other people cannot see how it will happen. That someone has caused cancer, is dying, and they, uh, they, they call you the hospital. And you lay hands on the person in Jesus' name, and the person shakes, and after that, the doctor says, what has happened? And the person gets up and walks home. You see, you are not a doctor. You are not injecting the person. But you laid hands and God used you. That's what anointing does. But the second thing the anointing does is that you as a human being, your best is just human. Your best in this world, eh? your brains for school, your energy, your best is human best. But when the oil comes in, God accomplishes more than your best. You see, God accomplishes more than your best. That's why it's called an anointing. Othniel was a judge in Israel because even though he was brave, the spirit came upon him and he did more than his bravery. Samson did more than his bravery. Jephthah did more than his bravery because when David, he did more than his boldness because the oil upon your life stretches your, your human talents beyond the natural into the supernatural. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, it is not my laying my chest, my legs on you for one week that will make the difference. <laughs> yes, many people were going around Jesus, rubbing themselves. But the woman with the issues, issue of blood for 12 years said in herself, if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And she went and touched. And she was healed. And Jesus said, who touched me? And Peter said, oh, too known. Too known. Too known. So many people around you and they say, who touched me? Oh, super spiritual. And Jesus said, someone has touched me because power, virtue has gone out of me. That's Mark chapter 5 verse 30. You know, and it means that Many people can come into this room, receive anointing and go, but they don't draw power. But some people say in their hearts that when I am touched, when I am anointed, this is going to happen to me. You see, Genesis 15, 6 says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted for him as righteousness. That's it. Therefore, I can assure you that there are a lot of people in this room whom God has his eyes on. He, he wants to use you for something which only you can do for him. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. You can be like John the Baptist's father and be asking, I'm old. How can this be? My wife too is old. How can I have a child? You can be like the captain on whose arm the king leaned. He said, if God opens windows in heaven, can this thing happen? You can be like Sarah and laugh. I'm old. My husband is old. Can anything happen to a 90-year-old woman? You, you can be like that. But you can be like Abraham. Abraham chose to believe God. And it was recorded for him as righteousness. You see the thing happening to you before it happens. That is the difference between faith and sight. The man of sight says, except I see, I touch Jesus, put my fingers in his palm and in his side, I will not believe his reason. But the man of faith says, 
I believe before I see. I believe. I embrace it. I confess it. Then I see. Let's read that one before we, we get her for the anointing. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Let's read verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen. We look not at the things which are seen. But are the things which are not seen. Ooh. We look not. You see, we don't fix our eyes upon the things which are seen. But upon things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal. The things which are seen, they last only a short time. They are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. But the things which are not seen, the things which are not seen, the things which are not seen, they are eternal. Ask your friend, what do you see? What, what are you seeing that when you are anointed today can happen to you, will happen? What, what are you seeing? Ask, ask him or her. What are you seeing? Do you have eyes? Are you seeing anything? <laughs> we look not at things which are seen, but things which are unseen. Because the things which are seen, they are temporary. Yeah, they pass away. They are transient. But the things which are unseen, 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 they are eternal. Wow. Ooh. So today, I want to give you a minute. Just write down what exactly you see happening to you from this anointing service. Just put it down. The things which you can see in the spiritual realm and embrace. See it. Embrace it. Confess it. And, and you know, live with it before it happens to you. What do you see about your ministry? What do you see about your church? What do you see? What do you see? Yes. What do you see? What can you see? I will need the the worship team. done if you have settled it you can be on your feet yes. keep seeing yourself receiving keep seeing yourself walking out of this room with that oil with that anointing yes heal my heart Oh, cry While on others Thou art called Only Do not pass me by Pass me now follow jfk mensa ministries on facebook and youtube and invite others to listen to his podcast 
You can also access some of JFK Mensa's books and keep up with his ministry at www.jfkmensaministries.org. God bless you.